Well, welcome back, or uh, I guess maybe welcome for the first time. We are in week three of our series, The Table, uh, where we're looking at the Lord's Supper, and specifically in this series, we're looking at how the Lord's Supper, or communion, or the Eucharist, or whatever denominational background or church background you grew up with, uh, we're looking at how the Lord's Supper can help us to see Jesus. And that phrase, see Jesus, is important for us at the Orchard because we want to, as a church, do all that we can to help you see Jesus clearly and minimize the distractions that we might bring to the table. But I feel that that phrase, see Jesus, is maybe even more relevant into the Lord's Supper because the Lord's Supper helps us to see Jesus as we look at it or really look through it differently. And what I mean is this. The first week we saw how the Lord's Supper helps us to look back as we remember the sacrifice of Jesus for our sins. So as we gather at the table of the Lord's Supper, it it is important for us to see that as a moment to step back to Paul's to remember who Jesus is and what he's done for us. And that idea of remembering and learning how to remember is crucial for believers and our spiritual formation as we grow in our faith. If we don't learn how to remember, we'll find that later down the road, our spiritual growth is severely stunted. And then last week, we said, okay, the Lord's Supper doesn't just help us to look back at the sacrifices of Jesus. The table helps us to look forward to the future promises of Jesus, namely his return and that moment when we gather with him in heaven face to face at a greater table for a better supper that is to come. You know, we said this last week that the Lord's Supper is really, for the believer, a foretaste of all the good that is coming our way in eternity. And it is those foretastes, like the Lord's Supper, that help us to cut through the fog of life and to see Jesus more clearly as we each day run towards him. So this week, uh, we're going to jump back in, and we're going to head back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So if you got your Bible, you can go ahead and go there, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We've been there in the previous two weeks, but before we get there uh, and start talking about it, let's just pause and talk a little bit more about the broader context of the Corinthian church and the reason that Paul wrote this letter to them. You see, the church here in Corinth was a church that Paul had planted on one of his missionary journeys. And uh, after he planted the church, he stayed there about 18 months, and then he left to go plant other churches. Well, after he was gone, there were a lot of divisions and factions that rose up inside of this church. And and I mentioned briefly last week that a lot of those factions and divisions were really among the haves and the have-nots inside of the city of Corinth. Uh, I think we can see this really clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, in verse 17, and that verse is where Paul starts to talk about the Lord's Supper, but he doesn't talk about it like, hey, hey, I'm talking about this with you because, man, you're so awesome, I just want you to learn more. Look at what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17. Paul tells them, he says, Now in giving this instruction, I do not praise you. <laughs> he says, since you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. So Paul says, hey guys, the whole reason that I'm telling you about the Lord's Supper is because you got issues, you got problems, you got stuff we need to address, and then specifically, the way you gather together to take the Lord's Supper is harming you. It said it's not for the better, it's for the worse. Uh, Essentially, the wealthy in the congregation were neglecting the poorer of their brothers and sisters. So as they would gather at the Corinthian church to celebrate this meal together, there was an overindulgence by the rich. Paul even tells us that many became drunk at this meal. In essence, the rich, the haves, turned this into a party that excluded the have-nots. Now we're going to dig a lot more into that specific context next week, so you don't want to miss that. Uh, But I want you to keep in mind the idea that Paul is writing this to the Corinthian church about the Lord's Supper as correction more than simple instruction. It was because of what they were doing wrong. Right, And so with that in mind, let's jump back into 1 Corinthians 11, but we're going to keep reading where we've been leaving off the last two weeks. The last two weeks, we've read verses 23 through 26. This week, we're going to pick up right back in verse 27. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 27, or chapter 11, verse 27. He says, So then, 
Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself. In this way, let him eat the bread and drink the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many are sick and ill among you, and many have fallen asleep. If we were properly judging ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned with the world. Now, if you have never read that passage before, if you've never heard that passage before, it's probably a little bit startling and with good reason because what Paul is saying here is that many of those in the church who had taken the Lord's Supper, uh, the bread and the cup, many of those in Corinth who had done that in an unworthy manner had gotten sick because of it. And some had even died because of it. And I think when we read that, It's like a shock to our senses. Wow, is that a thing? And maybe it begs the question, if that is a thing, what does it mean to take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner? Like, I hope it's something that I've not done. I hope it's something I'm not doing. What does it mean to take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner so that I can avoid that sickness and potential death? Well, really there are a a few different interpretations uh, about what it means to take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. And a lot of those uh, interpretations actually do have some merit to them. Uh, One good interpretation is that those taking the communion elements, that is the bread and the cup, needed to be fully aware that those elements represent the sacrifice of Christ by which we are redeemed from our sin. So if we take the Lord's Supper in a way that does not remember and understand its significance, we may be taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. I think um, another possibility is that the taking of the Lord's Supper with willful, like deliberate, unconfessed and hidden sin could potentially be taken it in an unworthy manner. Um, and, and we're going to dig into that here in just a minute, but I think that that idea has some merit as well. Uh, but probably the most specific meaning that Paul had in mind, we can understand by looking at the context of 1 Corinthians and the context of the church. Because remember, I told you about the issues they were having. Well, the earlier context of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, um, Paul mentions, and we talked about this, that some of the Corinthians were taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner because they were using that Lord's Supper as a means for self-indulgence. And that's why Paul says in verse 21, some of you even go to the point of getting drunk. So this on top of other relational issues that Paul deals with in 1 Corinthians from really the outset, seem to suggest that what Paul had in mind was that taking communion while you have these issues with other believers is at least part of what it means to take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. I think maybe the best way for us to understand what it means for someone to take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner is... The idea that as we take the Lord's Supper, we need to make sure that we are examining our motives in our hearts, that we need to take the Lord's Supper seriously, and that we need to understand that it represents the sacrifice of Jesus for his bride, we who are the church. So as we do those things, I think we can be assured that we are not taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner that we examine our motives, that we take it seriously, and that we understand that this is a representative uh, uh, ritual of the sacrifice of Jesus for his church. So, let's do this though. Let's take a minute and talk about what this idea of an unworthy manner does not mean. Because I think, at least in the part of the world and the kind of churches that I grew up in, there may be a wrong idea that our minds immediately jump to when we think about that unworthy manner. And here's what I mean. Taking the Lord's Supper while having sin in your life is not taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. Now, I know for many of us who grew up inside traditional church circles, what I just said, that having sin in your life is not what Paul means by taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. That may seem like borderline heresy, but I want you to hear me out for just a minute. 
You see, I think there are many believers who don't feel worthy of taking communion because they know that they're still sinners. But as believers, I think it's important that we recognize the Lord's Supper is for sinners, for specifically for believers who, though they believe, are still sinners, right? Paul didn't say that we had to be worthy to take part in the Lord's Supper, but only that as we take the Lord's Supper, we should do so in a worthy manner. Now, I don't know if that makes uh, a connection in your mind like it does mine, uh, but it reminds me uh, of a story that, that I read once uh, of a pastor in Scotland who, as they were taking communion at his church, noticed that there was a woman out in the congregation who refused to participate and just sat in her seat sobbing. And so the pastor leaves the table where he was at, and he goes to her side and he says, Take it, my dear. This is for sinners. So I think that that is a vitally important idea, that the fact we have sin in our lives, that we are not totally free from sin, is not a reason for us to abstain from the Lord's Supper. That's not what Paul means when he says that we take it in an unworthy manner. Now, I want to stop here and be clear, though, that the Lord's Supper uh, is not an excuse that makes sinning okay. Being forgiven of our sins by Jesus is not an excuse that makes us continuing in sin somehow all right with God. Followers of Jesus, hear me, should always fight against the sin that is in our lives. However, Christians should not keep themselves from the table if we're seeking to repent of our sin and are struggling to gain practical freedom from those sins, even if we haven't experienced full freedom from it yet. Now, I hope that makes sense, and I hope that brings maybe some clarity to this idea. I'm not saying that someone who is reveling in their sin, who is hiding their sin, who is embracing their sin, ought not be worried about it. What I'm saying is that as Christians, we all struggle with sin. But it is the struggle with sin that is what's important. In fact, it is the struggle and fight against sin that shows each of us even more clearly how much we still need Jesus and his grace in our lives today. We don't just need Jesus to save us and give us a fresh start. We need Jesus every day, as the old song says, every hour to help us in this constant and continual battle against the sin that indwells our flesh. Our struggle against sin in our lives is a reason that we should come to the table, not a reason that we should stay away from it. In fact, if we aren't actively fighting against sin in our lives, if we have a self-righteous sense that we are truly worthy of the meal, then it should be a red flag that we are in trouble. Now, don't mishear me. You see, the Lord's Supper does require that we examine ourselves. And Paul says that very explicitly in verse 28. However, I think that sometimes we can take the self-examination a little too far and get worried that somehow we've unknowingly, or maybe even in some cases we knew that we messed up, but somehow we have committed a sin that has made us all of a sudden unworthy. And the thing is, as we already said, Sin is a reality in all of our lives. There's not a one of us, you, me, anyone, that can claim worthiness on the basis of what we've done or or what we haven't done. And what we can't fall into is what one pastor calls paralysis by self-analysis. We can't be so worried that we may be forgetting something, overlooking something, that we neglect to come to the table, which... I think, honestly, in some cases, that paralysis by self-analysis that keeps us from coming to the table, in some cases, not every case, but in some cases, it can be an over-spiritualization and self-righteousness that disguises itself as false humility. As in, you want people to see just how serious you are because you know that you have sin in your life. You see, 
I, I think here's what the examination uh, of ourselves that Paul talks about should look like in the Lord's Supper. The examination that we need as we prepare together at the table is a healthy and a helpful time of reflection that is done in light of the good news of the gospel, right? It's not just, are we worthy? Are we good enough? but that we examine ourselves, our lives, our hearts, our motives in light of the gospel. We have to balance the truths that the Lord's Supper is a holy moment that is to be taken seriously and that it is a meal intended for sinners who have been redeemed by grace. Because of this, we come to the Lord's Supper with the realization that, yeah, we, we are sinners, but also with an awareness that through the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus on the cross in our place, we have already been forgiven of that sin. We're not coming to the Lord's table to get that forgiveness. We're coming to the Lord's table because we know we've been forgiven. The worthiness we need as we take the Lord's Supper isn't found in feeling really, really sorry for our sin or in doing some kind of penance that would earn our way back into God's good graces. Instead, our worthiness, so to speak, flows out of an awareness of our need for Jesus' sacrifice and our confidence in Jesus' sacrifice. That's what the worthiness comes from. Not our own works, not our own merit, not how bad we feel or how good we've done, but our worthiness comes on the basis of, of Jesus, who he is, what he's done, and our confidence in him. You see, it is this very awareness of our own sinfulness when it is coupled with our confidence in Jesus' forgiveness that allows that time of reflection and self-evaluation before the Lord's Supper to truly become an opportunity for repentance in our lives. That word repentance isn't a word that you hear a whole lot, especially outside of church circles. But repentance is really just the idea that we turn from our sin and turn to Jesus. And so as we gather at the Lord's table, preparing ourselves for this meal through reflection and examination, that awareness that we are sinners with a confidence in Jesus' ability and willingness to forgive creates a moment of repentance in our lives. As believers, we're not just repenting so that we might be forgiven of our sin, but we repent because we know we already are. Now, now, again, this is for believers, those who have trusted Christ, those who have been raised from death to life, those who know Him as Savior. We don't repent so that we can be forgiven of a sin that happened since our last repentance. No, we don't repent to be forgiven. We repent because of our confidence that we are. Because we know that the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus was given for us. And we have confidence that we can run to Jesus in spite of whatever sin that we see in the mirror of our own heart. Therefore, rather than seeing repentance as an emotional type of penance for our sins. Our repentance instead becomes a posture, a practice, and a process. What do I mean by that? Let me just kind of unpack that. I think a lot of times people see repentance as penance, which is I'm having to pay for the sins I've done. I know that Jesus will forgive me if I'm really, really sorry enough and I try to do better. No, no, that's not what repentance is. Repentance is a posture a practice, and a process. Repentance is a posture because it truly is the attitude of our heart before God that we come to Him broken and humble, but yet aware of His love and forgiveness toward us. It's a practice because repentance isn't something that's just going to happen by accident. We must choose to repent. We must choose to turn from our sin and turn to Jesus instead of following that natural inclination to run away from him and try to clean ourselves up. We choose to run to him instead. And repentance is a process because there is always going to be a struggle against sin in our lives. We will never arrive so, 
we always have to be quick to repent. Not something that we do begrudgingly and irregularly, but something that we are quick to do, running from our sin and running to Jesus. You see, I think as as we begin to understand that, as that moment of reflection leads to an opportunity for repentance, as we are fully aware of our sin and fully confident in Jesus' ability to forgive it, the Lord's Supper then becomes for us as believers both a moment of serious reflection and a moment of joyful thanksgiving. It is a moment of serious reflection because we are staring our sin in the face. And it is a moment of joyful thanksgiving because we know that sin is forgiven. So for us as believers, as we gather at the table, we look in to examine our hearts and we rejoice because we know that whatever we find there will be forgiven and made new in Christ. So I hope That as we have talked about the table for three weeks now, with one more week still to go, that you will join us as a church as we gather around the table next week. Now, it won't be here online. It'll be an in-person event, January 28th, 6 p.m. at the Branford High School Auditorium. And I hope that you have been convicted by the Word and the Spirit to see the Lord's Supper in a different light and are hungry to participate in it with the local church. And so if you are, or if you have any questions, reach out to us, let us know. Somebody's waiting right now that can help answer questions you may have, but I hope that you'll come and join us January 28th, 6 p.m., as we gather around the Lord's table together. Let me pray for you. God, thank you for the time that you've given us to look to your word, and I pray that as we have looked to your word, that your spirit would move in our hearts to convict us of our sin, But instead of leaving us simply broken, sorrowful, and devastated, would we be pointed to joy knowing that that sin has already been paid for and has already been forgiven and that there is nothing in our lives that we can't bring to you because of your love and grace toward us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.